Ladies and gentlemen, General Austin. You know, both uh, General Milley and I commanded uh, the 10th Mountain Division in the North Country. And as we looked out today, about 30 degrees, we said, hey, this is a good day for an outdoor ceremony. <laughs> and uh, Charlene and Holly Ann overheard that, and they said, of course, it's a great day for an indoor ceremony. <laughs> so there's no question about who's, who's carrying the weight. You know, back in 1971, I was looking at colleges, and one day my father sat me down, and he asked me, where I wanted to go to school. He was aware, obviously, that I'd been accepted to West Point and, and to Notre Dame. And I looked at him and I said, without hesitation, I said, Dad, I want to go to Notre Dame. <laughs> and he sat there for a moment and then he said, sounds good, son. We'll try this conversation again tomorrow. <laughs> so you know how that conversation went the next day. But as, as I look back on that decision and as I stand here today and reflect on the nearly 41 years that I have spent in uniform, I know that the decision to go to the United States Military Academy was one of the most important decisions of my life. It afforded me tremendous opportunities over the years since. and I do believe that it is appropriate that I begin today by thanking my dad who passed away many years ago Dad, thanks for always pushing me in the right direction. Chief, uh, General Milley, thanks for those kind words. We are incredibly fortunate to have you as our chief. Thanks to you and Holly Ann for what you have already done and all that you will continue to do in the coming years on behalf of our great Army and on behalf of the men and women in uniform and their families. And they are well represented here today, Chief, as you have pointed out, by the magnificent men and women of the Old Guard and the Army Band, Pershing Zone, and the flag bearers. Let's go ahead and give them another round of applause. You may or may not know that uh, in a former life, the commander of troops, Johnny Davis, was an aide of mine. Uh, I think that he likes uh, being a commander a lot better than his, his former job there, but he does it uh, magnificently well. Johnny, you and your troops are outstanding. General Dunford, Mrs. Dunford, Ellen, thank you both for being here. And Chairman, thanks for your tremendous support and for your friendship. Thanks also to the Joint Chiefs and my fellow combatant commanders for coming and for your support and your friendship. Other flag and general officers, and there is, as you heard the chief point out, there is an impressive number here today, including several former chiefs. Senior executives, and acting secretary of the Army, Murphy, it's good to see all of you. Special note to uh, Dennis McDonough, sir, thank you for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule to be here, and thanks for your unbelievable friendship. Other distinguished guests, and, and again, there are many here today. By the way, there's even a few of my high school classmates here. Go Bulldogs. It really is wonderful to see so many familiar faces, and you should know that it means a great deal to me and Charlene that you would take the time out of your very busy lives to be here. You know, I love the Army. And I have loved being in the Army these past 41 years, and I have been very fortunate for every day in uniform. In looking around and seeing so many dear friends, it makes me somewhat sad to leave, but I am uplifted by your presence and by the amazing talent that fills our ranks. And I hope to have the opportuni opportunity to thank each of you in person after the ceremony. You know, going back to the decision that I made to attend West Point, as you heard the chief point out, it is true. I actually planned to stay in the Army for just five years. 
I had a great experience at the Academy. I had a number of classmates, as you heard, that are here today. And gentlemen, we'll try this again. Courage and Drive 75, are you out there? All right, all right. I think they were, they're getting kind of old now, so they're probably sleeping, Chief, when you. But again, as the Chief pointed out, my plan was to do five years and then get out and go to law school. However, I quickly learned after joining the Army that I love soldiers, and I love being around soldiers, and I love being a part of a winning team. And so as I stand here today at the end of my career, and I look back on the many experiences that I've had, I am filled with awe. I am incredibly proud. Proud to have been a part of this exceptional team. Proud of all of our all that our great men and women in uniform have accomplished over the years, and proud to be a citizen of the finest nation that the world has ever known. You know, to be perfectly honest, I'm tempted to stand up here and tell war stories for a couple of hours, and I know the folks in the crowd would keep me honest because a lot of you were with me, and so they're your stories as well. But I'm tempted to stand up here and tell war stories. I spent 41 years doing what I love, being a soldier and doing it alongside some truly great people. Johnny, you might want to have the troops shake it out for a minute. You can feel free to do some push-ups if you'd like. As I said that, I, you know, I looked around, I saw some people shifting around in their seats here, but not to worry. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you war stories all day. I'm going to hold on to most of those stories so that I can tell them at the barbershop, well, you'll soon see me hanging out and playing checkers with the other old-timers. <laughs> Instead, on this day, my last day in uniform, I'd like to share a few simple thoughts with you as I reflect back on my life and my career in the Army. I'd like to share a few thoughts on those things that have proven most important to me over the years. Ladies and gentlemen, this business, our business, the profession of arms, this business is all about people. We don't win our nation's wars simply because we have the most technologically advanced military in the world, and we do. We win wars because we have the very best people serving in our ranks. And this has held true for more than 240 years since the birth of this great institution, the United States Army. And I and many others who have spent time in the military, I have seen our men and women in uniform do the most incredible things, both in peacetime and in combat. They make the impossible possible every single day. As I look back on my own experiences, it is their efforts it is their sacrifices, their achievements, that I am most proud of. As the Chief mentioned, I've been very fortunate to have had the opportunity to serve in key positions and to lead troops most recently as a commander of U.S. Central Command and prior to that as a commander in Iraq. And I'm grateful to President Obama, President Bush, Secretary Carter, Secretary Hagel, and Secretary Gates for their leadership and for allowing me those opportunities and for the tremendous trust and confidence that they placed in me. I've also spent a bit of time in combat, and those memories are deeply rooted in my mind. In combat, you experience the absolute best and the absolute worst of times. You see unparalleled camaraderie and teamwork on display under the most demanding conditions. And you see all that our troops will do and the tremendous sacrifices that they will make in support of the mission and in support of one another. Even when they are outnumbered or challenged on multiple fronts or given seemingly impossible tasks, our, tr our troops have proven time and again that they will do whatever it takes to be successful, no matter the circumstances. They will refuse to fail, and they'll figure out a way to get it done, regardless of the challenges that they are presented with. 
And we've seen this demonstrated countless times. And certainly over these last 14 plus years of conflict. And we have an obligation to ensure that our troops have all that they need to be successful. They deserve the very best. Ladies and gentlemen, your United States military is the most professional, the most disciplined, and the best trained force on the face of the earth. And it is a force that trains for combat, a force that trains to win, and we could not do what we do, nor would ours be the most capable military in the world were it not for the exceptional non-commissioned officers in our ranks. And over the years, I have served alongside some of the very best. My old airborne buddies, Command Sergeant Major Joe Allen and Command Sergeant Major Charlie Thorpe are here today. And they and many, many other outstanding NCOs, they kept me straight. They kept me focused. They served as my sounding board. And they made sure that our troops were well trained and well cared for. They taught me a tremendous amount, more than even they realize. And I'm sure of that. You know, I'll never forget when we were conducting the invasion into Iraq in 2003. And by the way, the division commander for the 3rd Infantry Division, who was my boss, is in the crowd today, Buff Blunt. But we were conducting that invasion, and there was some really tough fight fighting along the way. And on one particular occasion, we had a squad that was pinned down under some heavy enemy fire. And suddenly, one of the young soldiers, I think he was probably only 19 or 20 years old, he got up from behind his covered position and he charged towards the enemy position. And risking his own life, he eliminated the threat. It's truly amazing. And afterwards, when the unit was safe and out of harm's way, I approached the soldier and I asked him, hey, what made you do that? What made you run towards that enemy position? I asked him, were you afraid? And he looked at me and said, yes, sir, I, I, was, I was scared to death. But then I heard my squad leader's voice, and I knew that it was going to be OK. He said, I heard my squad leader's voice, and I knew that it was going to be OK. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no other profession on earth where a 19-year-old kid will get up and run towards an enemy position to save his buddies. And that young soldier did so because he trusted his squad leader, and he knew that he was there with him, leading him, and that he would take care of him. And that squad leader wasn't the exception. Indeed, our ranks are filled with non-commissioned officers just like the one who inspired that young soldier. This business truly is all about people. And while I've been fortunate to play a key role in a number of seminal events over the years, one of the things that I'm most proud of as I look back on my career, I'm proud to have had the opportunity to lead, coach, and mentor leaders, and in particular, young officers many of whom have gone, have gone on to hold key positions in our Army and in our military. And included in, um, among them are folks like the Chief, General Mark Milley, Dan Allen, Dave Perkins, Nadia West, Terry Farrell, Randy George, Mike Culpepper, and many, many others. These are great Americans. And as I have watched their careers and I've seen firsthand the tremendous contributions that they have made on behalf of our nation and our Army, it fills me with a level of pride that cannot be expressed in words. Or at least, it cannot be expressed by a simple infantryman like me. Over the years, I too have benefited from the mentorship and the wise counsel of a number of great individuals. Folks like General John Abizay, General Colin Powell, General Johnny Wilson, Julius Becton, Larry Jordan, Kip Ward, Fig Newton, and Larry Ellis. 
I owe them and countless others an enormous debt of gratitude. As Sir Isaac Newton famously wrote, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And certainly that has been the case in my life and in my career. Great leaders that I have looked up to and sought to emulate invested in me and invested in my development as a leader. They were there for me in good times and also in tough times and trying times. And they never sought reward of any kind. They simply wanted to pass on lessons that they had learned. And by doing so, they made me a better leader, a more effective leader, and most important, a better person. And I will be forever grateful to them for their support and for their confidence and for their efforts on my behalf. You know, I've had three primary goals in life, and they are to be loved by my family, respected by my peers, and feared by my adversaries. And I do hope that I have achieved some measure of success in pursuit of these goals. I am incredibly grateful for the love of my, my family. <coughs> my brother Morris, who was a former Marine and spent a career with the FBI. My four older sisters, Patricia, Serena, Carolyn, and Lloydette, and their spouses, and a number of my nieces, nephews, and a few of my aunts and uncles are here today as well. It is indeed a rare occasion to have so many of us together in one location. It's actually very special, and it means a lot to me to have them here, and so thanks to you all for coming. As you heard me say, I grew up with four older sisters. And they will tell you that they spent quite a bit of time and energy while we were young mentoring their little brother. And I will tell you that there is nothing that prepares you for combat, combat like growing up in a house with four older sisters. <laughs> but all joking aside, I am enormously grateful for their love and for their support. I'm looking forward to spending more time with them in the coming days. And there is a very, very special person who unfortunately is not here today, and that is my mother, Alicia Austin. She passed away when I was in Iraq, and I have missed her every single day since. She was the wisest woman that I have ever known. She was strong and compassionate and generous and loving. And for so many years, she was, for me, a confidant, an advisor, and a dear friend. And I know that if she was here with us, she would be proud of me, proud of all of her children, and proud of this great team assembled here today. And I know that she is smiling down on us now. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank her publicly for all that she did for me and for our family. Mom, I love you, and we miss you. You know, many years ago, I met a young lady with a twinkle in her, eye, in her eye and a beautiful smile and an infectious laugh. And from the moment I met her, she changed my life forever. As a commander, you make a lot of important decisions. That's part of the job. As I look back on the many decisions that I've made over the years, without doubt, the best decision that I ever made was the decision to marry my bride, Charlene. And over the years, she has been my best friend my closest advisor, my staunchest advocate, and I do believe my own good luck charm. She reminded me a number of times in recent weeks that I've been gone a whole lot. And in particular, over the past 13 plus years with three deployments to Iraq and one to Afghanistan. I was also gone quite a bit when I was commanding U.S. Central Command as well. And throughout all of it, she has supported me and supported our troops and our military families. You know, I recall calling Charlene up when I was in Iraq. I used to call her about once a week. And I would ask her, how are things going back there and how are the families doing? And she would say, don't worry about us, Lloyd. We're fine and we're going to stay fine. All you need to 
all, you, all of you need to stay focused on what you're doing over there, and you need to stay focused on staying well and staying safe. We will take care of the families. And she and the other spouses did just, just that. They supported one another, and they looked out for one another. And that enabled all of us who were deployed to focus our energy and our attention on our mission. And Char, I want to thank you for that, and I want to thank you for being my rock. You have made tremendous sacrifices over the years that we've been married. At the same time, you have co contributed immensely in support of our troops and our military families. And so this ceremony is as much about you as it is about me. And I want you to know how truly grateful that I am for your love and for your support. I'm looking forward to the many great adventures that lie ahead of us. And I love you with all of my heart. Charlene's dad, Tank Banner, was al always very supportive of everything that I did. And while he passed away, I want to take this opportunity to thank him for his support as well. I also want to thank her sons, Reggie and Shane. They've made many sacrifices over the years. And I'm grateful for their sustained support, the support that they've shown us throughout. And we're very, very proud of you both. Ladies and gentlemen, I will hang up my uniform for the last time later today. The fact is, I've only known one life, and that is the life of a soldier. And I have loved that life. And given the chance, I would do it all again in a heartbeat. I will miss it. I will miss it tremendously. I expect I'll miss it even more than I realize on this, my final day in uniform. But as I reflect back on the past 41 years, I am reminded of the good days, and there were lots of good days, and there were great days. There were also tough days. And the toughest days were the ones when you lost troops, troops you pledged to take care of, men and women who you sent into harm's way. And when you lose them, either in combat or as a result of an accident, when you lose them, their loss affects you profoundly. Indeed, it stays with you forever. And certainly, I will never forget the tremendous sacrifices made by our fallen comrades and their families on behalf of our Army, our military, and on behalf of a grateful nation. And the same applies to the men and women who were wounded or injured while serving their country and doing the bidding of the United States of America. We owe them, we owe them and their families our continued and strong support. And we must ensure that they're taken care of and that they are not forgotten after the fighting stops and the nation's focus, focus shifts to other things. Ladies and gentlemen, it's hard to leave an organization that you love, an organization that has had an enormous impact, not only in the world, but in your life as well. And I know it won't be easy, but as I look towards the future, I am filled with optimism. And I am filled with optimism because I recognize that today's generation of leaders is even better than, than my generation, than past generations. And the determined men and women who have answered the call, and all those who will answer the call in the coming years, they will do whatever it takes to be successful. They will confront any challenge and they will refuse to fail. And we must not fail them. The United States of America can do what no other country can do. We reassure and we enable our partners and allies. We deter and, when necessary, we soundly defeat our adversaries. Our presence has a proven and stabilizing effect. And the world depends upon us and looks to us for leadership. And that is in large part because we do have the most powerful, the most capable military on Earth. And going forward, we must ensure that we continue to invest in this critical capability, despite 
the many competing priorities. We must never lose sight of the fact that, as President Ronald Reagan once said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in their bloodstream. It must be fought for and protected and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day, we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free." End of quote. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a worthy investment. It is a necessary investment. I'll close with one of my fondest memories. On the night before we led the 3rd Infantry Division through the Karbala Gap <coughs> in southern Iraq in the spring of 2003, there was some really heavy fighting, and I'm sure that Buff Blunt and Dan Allen will remember this. I think Dan was busy capturing the city of Karbala that night. Nonetheless, that night there was some heavy fighting, and we had a fairly significant artillery duel as we exchanged gunfire with the elements of the Republican Guard. And the fight went on for most of the night. It was tremendous. The movement through the Karbala Gap was to be one of the most difficult maneuvers of the Iraq invasion. You see, we had to get an entire heavy division through an area that was only about two kilometers wide. And again, the intensity of the fighting throughout the night was extraordinary, to say the least. And then dawn broke. And as we were about to head out, a Bradley fighting vehicle rode by our position it was silhouetted by the rising sun, and on its antenna was an American flag, somewhat tattered and torn and soiled with the dust and the sand of the desert. And it was flapping in the wind. And I will never forget that image at that moment in time. It gave all of us who saw it a shot of pride and inspiration. And when I think back on that early morning, and I often do, I think about that tattered American flag whipping in the wind. And I am reminded of the courage and of the determination and of the patriotism of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and civilians, and all those who have served this great nation since its birth more than two centuries ago. And since that day, I have never looked at the American flag the same way. Even now, as I look out at Old Glory, I am filled with a rush of emotion. Because when these colors show up anywhere in the world, when these colors show up, things change. And they change for the better. There isn't a country in the world there isn't a military in the world that can do what your United States military, the most powerful, the most capable military, can do. And it has been an honor and a privilege to serve in this grand army of ours, this great military of ours, and to serve my country. Indeed, it has been the greatest honor and privilege of my life. Once again, thank you all for being here, and thank you for honoring my family by your presence. May God bless you. May he bless and keep safe all those currently serving in harm's way. And may God continue to bless the United States of America, the greatest country in the world. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.
Cause the feeling started long ago, one bleak and wintry morn. When the call rang out for volunteers to a nation being born. No sunshine patriot speeches, no summer soldier songs. To the special ones who paid the price to keep this country strong. When we were needed, we were there. We were there when we were needed, we were there. No, it wasn't always easy, it wasn't always fair. But when freedom called, we answered, we were there. If you want to find out who we are, just ask us where we've been. From the frozen fields of Valley Forge to a trail called Ho Chi Minh. Through the glory and the sacrifice, we do our job each day. We're citizens and soldiers, an army all the way. When we were needed, we were there. We were there when we were needed, we were there. No, it wasn't always easy. It wasn't always fair, but when freedom called, we answered, we were there. When we were needed, we were there. We were there when we were needed, we were there. No, it wasn't always easy, it wasn't always fair, but when freedom called, we answered, we were Thank you. 
Thank you for your attendance and enjoy the rest of your...